All right, um, now we, again, we'll take some time to kind of transit over into our sustainability segment. Uh, for those of you who have joined, just joined us, my name is Wayne, I'm your main MC for today. Uh, this morning, um, what you have missed uh, is the financial services segment, as well as our GIA Manila and Jakarta startup pitching. Uh, as, and just now, we just, you just saw the Go Korea program, which is our Korea market access programs entering in, into Southeast Asia. Uh, what's going to happen this afternoon, we will have the sustainability segment after this immediately. And then after that, we have the smart city segment. Um, and then roughly around the same time in the smart city segment, um, we will have our startup career sphere health program um, starting right across the room from here. It's going to be a small room, uh, smaller room with a, uh, with a door at the, at the other side of the, the, the foyer or the networking area. Okay, so for those of you who are interested in to, to listening into a health um, startups pitch as well as um, some content from uh, our partners like Roche as well as the National Healthcare Innovation Center. All right, so I think we are ready to move into sustainability. Um, a bit of housekeep housekeeping again, right? For, especially for those of you who are new here, uh, join us, just join us this afternoon. Um, Wi-Fi is Fairmont underscore meeting. Um, we will have tea break. Um, you know, I know some of you have just gotten lunch, uh, but we have tea break coming up. Uh, it's going to be served at about 2.30, 3pm. Uh, we'll continue without any breaks again, so, so we want to get all the setup pitches and all the, the great content up to you guys. And then uh, towards the end of the day, we do have networking for those of you who registered uh, to join us for networking after the event. Okay, um, without further ado, let me just hand over the time to Patricia, our Senior Director of Corporate Partnerships for Plug and Play APEC, and she will share with you a bit more of our sustainability program and platform uh, in the APEC region. Can we give uh, Patricia a round of applause, please? Thanks, Wayne. So welcome to our sustainability segment today. Uh, before kicking off, I'd just like to introduce myself again. My name is Patricia. I'm Senior Director of Corporate Partnerships here at Plug and Play. So if you're interested in sustainability, decarbonization, circularity, or government programs, please approach me and my colleagues. Now, before getting started, I'd like to just give a couple of updates. And uh, related to our sustainability vertical, it launched in 2019. And since then, we've had tremendous growth. In this year alone, we've onboarded 19 new partners, and some of these names include KSL Maritime Ventures, as well as GLP, Pathway, Alberta Innovates, and many more. And so with that, I'd like to invite uh, Matthew Claxton. He is our Global Sustainability Director and also a principal at the firm to give a couple more updates. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Claxton. I'm a principal at Plug and Play and the Global Director of Sustainability. And welcome to the Plug and Play Sustainability Singapore Summit. We're very excited to have you here. But before we get into today's events, I just want to give you a quick overview about what we've been doing in sustainability over the last few months and actually over the last few years. So I'm very proud to say that Plug and Play Sustainability has actually recently just turned three. So October 23rd was our three anniversary. Um, and since that, we have launched eight different locations around the world, five different industry pillars, made 28 investments in some exciting companies and partner with over 30 different corporations and help form over 210 pilots and POCs with the startups that we've accelerated. And more importantly, I believe we've helped um, those startups raise over $145 million in capital. So if you're new to plug and play sustainability, our journey really starts here with our founding partner, the Alliance in Plastic Waste. And what this group is, is a global consortium of about over 70 corporations from all around the world and all across the plastic value chain that have come together with the mission of ending plastic waste in the environment over the next five to 10 years. Plug and Play's role is that uh, we have been running their global accelerator program for them. So in 2020, we launched programs in Silicon Valley, Paris, and in Singapore. In 2021, we then launched um, programs in Shanghai, Sao Paulo, and Johannesburg. And then earlier this year, we actually launched our seventh program with the, the Alliance on Plastic Waste in Tokyo. Now, it's very clear that our work has been, you know, covering the world and covering a lot of different parts of plastics. And our work has actually been recognized externally, where I was very excited to share that Plug and Play has been named the second most impactful VC by Climate 50 last year. So not only have we been doing all this great work in plastics, but we've also launched initiatives in carbon neutrality, 
clean resources, which is a mixture of energy and water with the Alberta government, shelter tech with Habitat for Humanity, and lastly, sustainable fashion. Now, the reason these two pillars are in green is because those are the two new programs they've actually started this year alone. So plug and play sustainability has had a pretty rapid and massive growth over the last um, three years, and we cannot wait to see what 2023 has in store for us. Now, behind this is our global ecosystem of exciting startups. So today, plug and play as a whole has over 72,000 startups in our ecosystem that we call Playbook. And plug and play sustainability actually has over 6,000 sustainability focused startups in our ecosystem. Now, these all range from pre seed to Series E or F just before they go public. Now, what you're seeing is actually a snapshot of what we call our value chain reports. And these are uh, proprietary to plug and play, where we've broken this uh, sustainability sector into different segments in order to be able to really understand where the emerging trends, where the market saturation is, and where are kind of key areas that VCs and corporations should be investing and focusing on. Now, this is an example of our plastic waste value chain, decarbonization, and um, textile value chain reports, but we have eight of these that cover 64 different sectors across sustainability. And not only are we using these reports and all this information and data to help with our corporate partners and our accelerator programs, but we've also been using this to invest very heavily into the sustainability sector. So we've done 28 investments over the last three years, half of which have been hardware, half have been software. I'm very proud to say that 42% of that portfolio actually has a female founder on, on board. And that portfolio today has raised over $400 million of capital. And now we've been, been investing in some of the areas that you saw on my previous slide with the program. So we've been investing in carbon neutrality, circular economy, clean, re, clean energy, and lastly, water. Now behind all this great work and what you're seeing here today is this great team of amazing and passionate people that wanna make a difference in sustainability and ultimately in the world. And they wanna focus on investing in early stage companies, working with our corporate partners and accelerating startups all with the mission of driving impact. Now, if you're interested in getting involved in our plug and play sustainability program, please feel free to reach out to myself or a member of our team who are more than happy to chat with you. Have a great rest of the event. Take care, everyone. Thank you for those updates, Matt. So again, remember to get in touch with our team if you'd like to find out more details about our programs. Now, for the next part of our segment, we're very happy to put together a curated panel to give some insights into how different industries are looking at the net zero challenge. So with that, I'd like to invite some of our speakers, Julia, who'll be moderating the panel, as well as uh, key speakers from different sectors like Alberto, Lynette, and Tarun. Now, please give a warm welcome and applause for all the speakers here. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Hope you all had a good lunch. Yes. Um, so thank you for joining the sustainability panel today. Um, well, as you have seen for our mattress presentation at the Habitat for Humanity, we're very happy to partner with them for the Shelter Tech Initiative. We have run um, various accelerators around the world and supported over 100 startups. Um, so we're very glad to partner with Plug and Play to elevate our partnership. Um, and today we give the chance to our panelists to introduce themselves, talk about their work. But let me start with our first question, so, and then each of you can, can maybe share more of your expertise. Um, so first of all, can you share more about how decarbonization and e ESG targets um, are not or should not be just compliance driven, but more importantly, an opportunity to create value? Um, how does your organizations create impact and view your net zero commitments? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question and really pleased to be here today. Uh, quick introduction. Um, I'm Tarun. I lead strategy at Rightship. Uh, what we do at Rightship is basically enable transparency around certain key elements of E, S, and G vertical within the maritime industry and specifically around freight selection. Uh, if you think about global trade, about 70 to 80 percent of global trade by volume today moves by ships. If you think about the way energy is consumed around the world, 40% of the ship movements today move fossil fuels. I mean, you know, the, the, the crude oil, the LNG that powers, including uh, Singapore. The ultimate challenge for net zero is not just about finding the next silver bullet of the future fuel. It's about thinking through the entire value chain on how you select the freight. Is the freight green? Is the freight safe? And the role at Rightship, what we really are proud of is effectively enabling that freight selection in a safe and a sustainable manner. 
if you think about decarbonization within the shipping industry, it's a massive and a multi-layered problem. And why so? Shipping is basically a derived demand. If the global trade is moving, you will have massive more demands for uh, ships effectively. If you think about what happened during the COVID lockdowns, the shipping industry almost kept the conveyor belt of global trade moving. And it had its own sort of suites of problem, whether around humanitarian crisis or seafarers that were running the ships. The ultimate challenge here is to solve the problem, not in isolation as an industry, but to collaborate with the actors that use shipping. Let me give you a very specific example. Most of the fuel that today burns on ships is the last distillate of what comes out of the ground. There is a massive push to find the new silver bullet of what that fuel for shipping industry could be. Is it gonna be hydrogen fuel cell? Is it gonna be methanol? Is it gonna be ammonia? The jury is still out there. Ultimately, the industry needs to work together with some of the other players on land, so the oil majors or the new energy majors, including the infrastructure providers. Uh, in, from a Singapore context, it's one of the biggest bunkering ports. Now, what does that mean? Singapore is effectively, in, in a very simple language, a key fuel station for the shipping lanes around the world. For Singapore to play its role, it would also have to join the conversation, which is actually doing so in a very active manner, to facilitate the transition of the fuel of the shipping industry, which can also then sort of have a downstream impact on some of the other uh, industries. The key ultimately would be to enable transparency on how shipping is getting its act together and what's the downstream impact of it. Uh, so with that, a very specific problem that we are today also enabling to solve is freight selection, how green or safe it is, but also how we can account for scope three emissions for the shipping leg. Thanks. Thank you, Tarun. Maybe we can hear now from Lynette. Hi, everyone. I'm Lynette Leong from uh, Capital Land. I lead the development and growth of uh, funds investing in ESG projects and companies and solutions, whatever that's to do with ESG. Uh, in the building industry or the real estate industry, I'm not sure whether you are aware that Unfortunately, we contribute to 40% of global carbon emissions. And that's not just the operating buildings alone, but in the whole, the construction process, ranging from the production of materials all the way to how we manage, how we uh, power the building. Um, so like a building like this, for example, which we own, uh, you know, I hope that you don't feel cold, which is good. Uh, in many buildings, you find that it is too cold, but if you were to just increase the temperature by a little bit, you can save tremendous energy. Uh, and in today's uh, uh, market where energy prices are so high, you can imagine the amount of savings that you can get. So we've been doing this for the past um, decade. We have managed to save $320 million uh, since 2008. And that is uh, by, you know, adopting very energy efficient practices and uh, also water efficient practices. Um, but that cannot continue because we, will, we don't think we can generate this amount of uh, savings going forward without new technologies. And I think that's where uh, plug and play comes into play and comes into play, all right. <laughs> uh, and um, I think the other financial benefit that we see is that uh, other than just savings, we have been able to achieve a discount of our interest rate of sustainability-linked loans. So what we have been doing is, uh, with a few banks, uh, they have given us loans that are tied to our sustainability performance. And when we reach the targets, they give us a discount of our interest rate. And that's been very helpful. Uh, but that, again, uh, we've, we think that there is also a limit because without new technologies, we will not be able to, going forward, achieve uh, some of the gains. Um, and it, it, in addition to that, I think the impact that we have uh, managed to achieve is to have reduced our carbon emissions intensity by 55% since 2008. Now, we have set net zero targets. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a sustainability master plan where we have set ambitious targets for 2030. And they are not just energy related, they are also water, waste, indoor air quality, um, especially after COVID. So there are many different metrics that we are targeting ourselves to achieving. And therefore, uh, in order to do that, 
new innovation has to come in. It is actually estimated that uh, about 275 trillion US dollars will be required from now till 2050 to, you know, in the decarbonization strategies to reach net zero. That's globally. And of which, uh, and that's equivalent to about 9.2 trillion US dollars per annum, of which 1.7 trillion dollars is required for the real estate sector. So you can imagine the amount of capital that is required, and but with capital, it means that you need to have deliver the right return. So thankfully, uh, through our sustainability challenge that we organize on an annual basis, and thanks to Plug and Play that helped us for this year, uh, we have uh, achieved, uh, we have actually garnered um, uh, close to 800 submissions over the past two years. We are now piloting 20 projects, uh, and uh, we're already seeing some positive, uh, promising results. For the energy efficiency uh, solutions, we are able to achieve about 8 to 15 percent ROI. And that's for the solutions alone. Of course, if you're investing in the company, we should expect a much higher multiple. Well, so what we provide in Capital Land is we have sandboxes for the companies to, uh, to, to pilot their projects. We provide the funding, which probably does not mean a lot to startups, but what is more valuable is the opportunity to scale up your uh, prop the solutions if you're successful across over 40 countries uh, around the world, more than 200 cities that we have uh, where we have properties in. So I think that is where we are providing hopefully the impact to catalyze the market to developing you know, innovative solutions to help solve the problems of the built environment. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, that's what I will share for the time being. I think uh, I will let uh, Alboto share the next one. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alberto Muñoz. I'm business incubation leader at Schneider Electric. Uh, I'm part of um, Schneider Electric Ventures, which is the corporate venture arm of Schneider Electric. We manage a um, 1 billion euro fund from Schneider. And our focus is to accelerate disruptive innovation for Schneider in the space of uh, energy transition, clean tech, and industry 4.0. Um, and specifically, my role is about looking to launch new disruptive businesses for Schneider by uh, partnering, investing, and uh, incubating new startups. Um, to the point around uh, net zero uh, from a Schneider angle, there are three different areas uh, where we touch around net zero from a business perspective. Um, the first one is uh, we, as a corporate, have very strong commitments on uh, uh, net zero. We are one of the founding RE100 companies in Europe. And um, last year, we were ranked number one sustainable company in the world. I think this year, we're like top five. So we're still there, quite, quite there. Um, and we should be achieving um, uh, net zero for a scope one and two emissions in, in the next two, three years. So we, with that, uh, we have a very strong commitment, as I mentioned, ESG. And just to give you an idea, um, one third of our all the company annual bonus, including mine, is linked to these ESG targets that we have commitments to, right? So this is something that is cascaded down to the whole organization from the CEO to the, to the, um, to the new uh, colleagues that come freshly graduate. Now, and then obviously we have all kind of initiatives to help us decarbonize and be more circular and so on and so forth. Now the second angle, which is more to your question, uh, we are in the sustainability business, so we are, um, uh, Schneider Electric is global leader on energy management and industrial automation solutions. Uh, and we focus on four major segments, buildings, data centers, industry, and infrastructure. Uh, we are not a utility. We don't produce energy, but we help to manage more efficiently. We also uh, support electrification to move more into electricity from fossil fuels, but also this decentralization of en uh, energy generation to enable for... Um, uh, renewables. On top of that, many of our solutions help all these assets to be managed more efficiently, uh, which obviously has financial gains, but also it can reduce energy consumption, reduce carbon footprint, and increase the resilience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, on top of that, not only we have all these hardware, software, and services solutions to help 
decarbonize and be more efficient to all these companies. But also we have uh, our own sustainability business consulting arm, um, which work with uh, large corporates and now starting with SMEs, um, companies on their sustainability journey, right? So as I mentioned, Schneider, we have been a bit ahead of the curve for a few years. So um, we are now helping other corporates uh, to achieve their commitments from uh, helping develop uh, their strategy around decarbonization, but also supporting them on the execution to first uh, reduce their energy consumption and second one, uh, being able to move more into use of renewables, etc. So that's the second component around, uh, which is our core business, right? Our core business is around net zero and sustainability. The third component is about corporate venturing, which is the space I, I work on. Um, as I mentioned, we have a one billion fund, and the we, we, our first fund uh, it, it was 500 million. We already have more than 50 investments, 40 plus are companies that we have invested across the world. 10 plus are companies that uh, we have uh, incubated and launched, including here in Singapore. And, um, and th frankly, the return of the fund is, is quite positive. But besides that, obviously, from a, as a corporate, we are looking to accelerate or disruptive innovation via these uh, investments and partnerships with these startups. Um, so I think that's, that's, uh, that's a bit the, the, the story for Schneider, right? So three angles for Net Zero. One, very strong commitments. Second one, it's our core business. And third, also we look into innovation via corporate venturing on this space. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's very interesting to see the different approaches that your organizations have towards net zero. Um, and you touch also upon the seeking disrupted innovation that can help to bring more sustainability into your organizations. And with that in mind, and also, you know, I know a lot of our audience today are startups. Um, with your imp Im impact commitments in mind and the chances to add value, um, why, maybe you can share more about why are you investing in and partnering with startups? What role do you see that they play into your organizations reaching, reaching their net zero commitments? Would any of you like to start? <laughs> I can go first, yeah, okay. Uh, let me just sort of set the stage here uh, again, a quick, uh, sneak peek into the shipping industry. Uh, for moving a cargo from one part of the world to the other part, one is shipping is an extremely asset intensive industry. Uh, but number two complexity is the number of actors that are involved from an operations perspective, from an ownership perspective, and from a financing perspective are many. The problems of the shipping industry, whether it's around decarbonization or even digitization and digitalization has been for a while. Uh, the reason we are looking at the startup ecosystem as an industry is basically to look at solutions which have scaled, which have matured in some of the other industries that we can start pivoting into the maritime or the shipping industry. Uh, if you look at Rightship, what we do, uh, essentially the pathway of partnering with early stage and mature startup allows us to also look at scaling some potential solutions with our market reach to some of the pain points and connecting uh, to the pain points of our potential customer. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, the third element there is it's basically having a hedge. It's, it's a portfolio approach. Let's face it, startups have the ability to move at a slightly different pace than incumbents. And our thinking is if you can actually have the incumbents or the subject matter expertise or the market access coupled with a potential pace of uh, you know, the founders of the startups in a well-defined setting, it could be a pretty interesting way to solve some of the specific solution. Let me give you an example. Uh, if you think about the seafarers or the individuals that run the ships out at sea, there are about 1.5 to 1.6 million uh, seafarers. Uh, all of them have their own identities in terms of the passports, but they're also carrying their old sets of competency certificates and all sets of health checks, whatever is required. The issue is they come from different parts of the world. Different parts of the world, although has an international legislation that dictates a minimum compliance standard, but the certificates look very different, just like our passports. The, and the seafarers move around the world. Partnering with some of the startups that you might also hear uh, later down uh, the road is, can we come up with solutions which enable a singular way of capturing this data in a way to solve 
the movement of these seafarers around the world. So basically, this problem has been solved in some of the other industries, including certain companies in Singapore, and we are looking at ways of basically bringing that technology into the shipping industry. And the problem is not technology, the problem is the business model for our industry. And uh, it could be because the, the shipping industry has been quite traditional in the way it is operated, but I think we are getting there. The pace of innovation in the last sort of three years, uh, or the conversation in the shipping industry over the last sort of three to five years has changed dr dramatically. And the openness to learn from some of the other industries, learn from corporate venturing experiences of, you know, the industrials or the oil majors is there. And I think uh, that's the way forward uh, uh, for, for us as an industry as well. Thank you, thank you, Tarun. Uh, Lynette, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, yeah, my response is actually quite similar to yours, um, Tarun. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that we have our sustainability challenge. Uh, and that's one of the, it was an inaugural uh, uh, way to engage with startups. So traditionally, the built environment or the real estate sector, we are quite slow. <laughs> We're quite slow in adopting new innovation uh, because it is a very capital intensive business. We are very focused on just building the real estate and uh, some of the, and it's a long gestation period. Uh, and and uh, when we work with uh, companies, we tend to work with uh, those that are established, uh, already have the solutions. We are not so, uh, we are pretty mo much more risk averse. Uh, but we now acknowledge that in order to reach, reach net zero or the sustainability targets that we have set for ourselves, we do need to work with uh, startups to build new technologies and then to see them go through the different phases. Uh, the other aspect that Terry mentioned was about uh, building that innovation culture within the company. So we also want to use this opportunity for the, during the interactions to open the mindset of our people not that they're closed, uh, but then to ex help them to explore new opportunities out there, um, not just in the new technologies, but also new business models. So increasingly, we are also seeing that, uh, given that it is a, it is a capital-intensive business, so for example, if you are going to put solar panels on our rooftops, just a simil simple, simple example of renewable energy, it is expensive, right? Um, and for us, when we are investing in real estate, to add that additional capex is actually going to reduce our return, which is not good. So how do we find new business models where we don't have to pay the capex, uh, where it is an OPEX, as in it is like a pay-as-you-use service, uh, you know, a, a, a SaaS model. Uh, um, you know, so these are the areas of uh, not just innovation in technology, but innovation in business model. I think that will be quite important when we are looking at innovation. So we, we want to, as an industry, we want to be able to explore this kind with, uh, with different, different uh, partners, different startups that, have, that bring new ideas. And uh, actually, in our sustainability challenge, uh, we have uh, been very pleasantly surprised by the, um, the amount of innovation that's happening across the world. So I mentioned about the close to 800 submissions we had. They came from over 40 or close to 50 countries around the world over the past two years. So um, that's really opened our mindset to help people understand that there are a lot of uh, innovation out there. And what we want to do is be, to be able to catalyze that with uh, not only funding, but the ability to provide sandboxes uh, over different geographies, also different property types, besides uh, this Raffle City that you're looking at, uh, which is uh, office and shopping mall, we also have hospitality space, we have data centers, logistics properties, um, industrial space. So the startups can then uh, scale up, not just in one property type, but in different property types. So I think this is also enabling ourselves to understand that the solutions out there can maybe can be replicated with from one, prop, one uh, property type to another, but maybe there are new solutions involved as well. So I think that's, uh, I hope that summarizes what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Lynette. Uh, Alberto, would you like to add a few words? Yes, so um, 
from a Schneider Electric perspective, uh, corporate venture is not an option anymore, it's a must, right? So uh, we, we are a $30 billion revenue company and we invest roughly 1.5 billion R&D every year. And we are a technology company or, ourselves, right? In the space of energy management and industry automation. Uh, but we recognize that even though we have a, a lot of investment in R&D, uh, quite often it's difficult to compete with the startups uh, just purely because they have access to much more capital via venture funding. Uh, also, they have a lot of talent. Uh, they have, and, and there are certain areas of disruption that for corporates is difficult to attract the right talent, right? If we're thinking about data scientists or artificial intelligence, so uh, corporates, uh, again, may even have a hard time to even understand um, uh, that th this kind of talent, right? And it's difficult to find, um, create an interesting career path for this uh, type of entrepreneurs. So the way we see to tackle that is to corporate venturing, right? Um, and then that's what actually our corporate venture arm is called Innovation at the Edge. Uh, we have the innovation that happened at the core through R&D, and then we have the innovation at the edge that happened through our corporate venture activities, right? Um, as I mentioned before, we have uh, more than 50 investments. 20% of those are companies that we have incubated and launched ourselves. And, um, and out of those, in the last, this is in the roughly in the last four years, out of those already three companies have been fully acquired by Schneider Electric as they recognize the strategic uh, interest. And, and two of them actually in the US have become now the foundation for a completely new business unit uh, that has been created from Schneider in, in the space of sustainability. So for us, we see as uh, uh, corporate venturing, again, as a must have uh, to make sure that we remain relevant uh, to our customers, to make sure we focus on disruptive innovation versus the more uh, often uh, short term uh, return focus of uh, corporates on the, through the R&D and then uh, identify new ways to uh, not being disrupted, but actually be a disruptor uh, by supporting and um, being part of the ecosystem of startups that are uh, disrupting our industry. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, everyone. We have the panel here saying, please wrap up. Uh, so I think we will end the panel here. Uh, but hope it was able to give all of you some insights on how some of the leading organizations in Singapore, in Asia, and around the world are incorporating sustainability and innovation in their work. Um, so we can end with a big round of applause for Tyrone, Lynette, and Alberto. Thank you very much. And yes, we'll give the floor back to plug and play for the rest of today's agendas. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you once again to Tarun, Alberta, Lynette, and Julia for the great insights and sharing. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John, and I drive business development for the region for our sustainability and government verticals. Um, so for today's segment, uh, I'm actually going to be your MC specifically for this uh, segment. Before we get started on our startup pitches, I'd like to reintroduce our networking tool, uh, Brella. With Brella, you can easily connect with our pitching startups directly by following the three steps on screen. Uh, so do download the, the Brella app and start connecting now. So kicking off this segment, we have seven amazing startups from our sustainability program who will pitch to you today. Uh, we have a variety of startups covering the environmental, social, and governance aspects of sustainability. You won't want to miss it. Bringing up our very first startup, we have Fishtail. Founded just last year, Fishtail cuts across geographic banking boundaries and allows freight forwarders to offer financing to their customers within minutes. Uh, take it away, Fishtail. Hey guys, good afternoon. Thanks for coming out. I'm gonna run up as fast as I can because I know I only have three minutes and I have to pee, so it's gonna be great. Um, well, hi, uh, I'm Mark. Uh, I run a company called Fishtail. Uh, and after jumping, uh, after selling my previous business in the working capital optimization space, I jumped back into it with the company I want to share with you today. Um, in short, we are an embedded fintech provider for logistics companies that basically enables the small guys to compete with the big guys by, you know, embedding financial services. Uh, but before I kind of tell you what that means, let me tell you about logistics. Uh, generally speaking, things get moved around the world using something called a freight forwarder. Procter & Gamble will say, hey, DHL, move something from here to here. They'll say, okay, let's go get Maersk to move it. Let's pay customs. Let's get all this stuff moving around. Flexport 
is one of these new guys that has been eating everybody's lunch, and the industry hates it. Um, they're basically seen as kind of the Amazon of, of, of the supply chain. And, and they've been eating everybody's lunch because they're able to provide financial services. Uh, it turns out that most financial institutions won't work with freight forwarders because it's a very complicated business, lots of jurisdictions, lots of documents. Flexport's been verticalizing and doing all sorts of crazy stuff by offering their own financing. We're trying to arm the rebels to basically take back control uh, from the, the scary guys. Uh, turns out that in order to lend in all of these jurisdictions, you gotta file liens, you gotta be able to underwrite transactions. It's a super hairy problem. Um, tech solves a lot of these issues. So hypothetically, 10 years ago, the tech didn't exist to solve any of these problems. So we built it, uh, we track every boat in the water, every point in the sky, we do all sorts of crazy shit to make sure that you know, the things that we're financing are actually kosher to finance. We even built global financial infrastructure to pay suppliers, to get repaid by customers. Uh, and in uh, every country that we operate in, we need to be able to you know, actually file liens, make sure that we're compliant. Um, Behind the scenes, we work with a bunch of different asset managers. We originate transactions that, that meet the, the characteristics of these asset managers. So let's say I'm HSBC and I want to get 8% return in these jurisdictions. We'll originate those assets, give them to HSBC, bing, bing, boom, everybody makes money, life is good. Uh, and because we're gluttons for punishment, we're also trying to turn trade into an ESG investable asset class. That's why we're here. Uh, so we predict the CO2 emissions for everything that moves, and we can tie the interest rate of our financing directly to the, the emissions that are generated. Um, I've got a few seconds, so I'll do it fast. A uh, little snapshot of what the product looks like from the perspective of a borrower. We embed ourselves into their existing workflow. We replace their AR and AP automation tools. We'll you know, pay suppliers. We'll grab data from their TMSs. Um, the market is insanely huge. It's the last industry that's left to create Rockefeller-style wealth. Uh, super simple model. We make money off money. Great team, we're all over the place, uh, ranging from a uh, former partner at Deloitte to a guy who's run trade finance funds that you know had billions of dollars under management. We're actively lending around the world. Please come find me out there. I'm happy to talk tech and sustainability. I'm a few seconds over, thank you. Thank you, Fishtail. So next up, uh, we have Credentials. Credentials is a budding SaaS company determined to revolutionize crew onboarding and certification management within the maritime industry. Bring it on, Credentials. Uh, so thank you, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we are uh, Credentials. Um, and before I uh, get too far through uh, what we do, I'd like to share a little bit about why we do it. So this began with uh, a very long week of late nights, one man trying to onboard a significant number of crew obtaining their personal data by uh, email, by PDF, by paper. It was a painful process, but it inspired credentials. So I'd like firstly to actually thank Taran for uh, setting the scene a little bit for uh, what happens in the, in the maritime sector. So we have millions of seafarers um, across the, the globe. They each come with hundreds of career-related data points. These data points are pretty standard across the people and across the industry but they have to be repeatedly entered into different systems. Obviously, with repetition, you end up with inaccurate data, and I dread to think the st state of data in some of the systems. Obviously, this can lead to pretty significant um, compliance risks. So we challenged ourselves to consider, is there an alternative solution? And we really believe there is, and Credentials is that system. So what we've done is we have tipped seafarer credential management on its head. We have put the seafarer back at the heart of their own data with an individual crew wallet that can then integrate with various systems, including our own onboarding portal that can be used by managers, employers, etc. So what does this actually mean? So we have systemized a significant amount of maritime knowledge, um, which has enabled us to digitalize various processes that are currently done manually. So we've enabled digitalization of auditing, onboarding, we are building trusted and reliable data, and we can drive verification and improve our compliance significantly. We won't be the only solution out there, but we will be working with these alternative solutions with our common purpose and vision. 
So why are we different? There are other solutions out there, digital wallets, but they are generally tied to one purpose only, such as digital uh, certification. We are the platform to bring together the data from those various solutions. What we've built to start with, and this we, was something we were told we couldn't do by maritime and software um, experts, is build a piece of technology to machine read certificates, extract the data, and then apply certain processes to it. But we've done it, and we can do this all in less than five seconds. We've been really busy in the last three years building, iterating and our, our product and taking on our initial um, key supportive clients. What we're now ready for is to develop our strategic partnerships um, and expand our client base. We believe that crew data should be free for crew to manage throughout their career, so we only charge the people who need access to manage that data. So as a founding team, we believe we've got it all. We've got a data protection expert, we've got a software expert and a maritime expert, and we believe that we can deliver our vision. And that's where you guys come in. We're out there and we would be delighted to speak to you all. Many thanks. Thank you, Credentials. Uh, next up, we have C Lucian. Uh, C Lucian is a B2B hardware enabled software startup that provides connectivity on board merchant vessels to enable efficient data collection below deck. Uh, take it away, C Lucian. Hi, everyone. My name is Yuvil Blanke, and I'm here today talking about Solution. Solution is a B2B hardware-enabled software company that operates in the maritime sector. Our goal is to enable IoT solutions at sea. Ever since the steel balls were introduced into these ships, there's been an issue. And that's the fact that there is no connectivity below deck, basically because of the cage of Faraday. Now, obviously, a lot is happening below deck. You have to imagine that this is a ship of up to 400 meters with often crew as little as 15 people. And if something goes wrong with the machinery, or if a crew member goes missing, you kind of want to know what's happening downstairs. So we came up with a hardware solution. We use the existing infrastructure of the ship to actually be able to send through those signals. How do we do it? We basically install a receiver inside each room, and then we use our proprietary technology to send that data over the existing wiring of the ship up to the bridge. That way, the captain knows what's happening with each machine, he knows where the crew members are, and solves a lot of issues this way. Now, we have a few use cases that we actually worked out, and there's, a, there's one specific one that we want to focus on today. Obviously, it's very important for a ship owner that its that the ships can just operate perfectly. So for him, knowing what sensors are working, knowing which machines and pressure is turning up, it's very important because it saves him a lot of money. If a ship is standing still, it can cost up to 500,000 USD per day. Now, besides that, crew safety is very important. So we actually came up with a way to check in on the crew members. For this, we are working together with Care4C. Uh, Care4C has produced a bracelet which allows us to connect their bracelets as an IoT sensor with our receiver. And that way, if they are below deck in one of the 200 rooms, they can send a distress signal. And that way, the captain knows exactly where the crew members are. We are operating in a market with very specific competition. So for us, um, the biggest competitor out there is ScanReach. And ScanReach is actually trying to solve the same issue, but by doing it in a wireless way, whilst we are wired. So ScanReach will operate using a mesh network. And the big issue with that is that once you have very sizable ships, it becomes quite unreliable. For us, as we are wired, we have 100% reliability. In terms of where we are today with our sector leads, we have partnerships and LOE signed with Eastern Pacific Shipping, which manages over $17 billion worth of ships, and also with Sea Trade, which manages over $5 billion worth of ships. So for us, being able to transfer one of those contracts would mean a big deal. We have a very complementary team. I myself come from a background in investment banking. Our CEO, Sebastian Hammers, he comes from a background of, uh, in the marine world itself, which was obviously very important for our company. We have Romeo, who is a civil engineer specialized in translating the software to the hardware. We have Giles front end, Anthony back end, and three switch works on the DevOps. And we have some interesting partners already. We were very early on scouted by Techstars. We run with uh, Port Excel, part of MCA Labs, uh, created Destruction Lab, you know, name it. It's very important for us. And we feel like that's, a, that's an added value. So where are we today and where do we want to go? Um, up until today, we've run a lots of demos and actually proven that we can go from the deepest part of the ship up until the bridge. Our next step for us is actually doing a four-week pilot on one of the ships, and that's going to be with Sea Trade. 
Um, for us, obviously, this is going to be a really big step. We're actually in the commercialization phase right now and want to move to that point early on in 2023. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Solution. Uh, next up, we have ScoutBase. ScoutBase helps maritime companies to reduce human error and act before accidents happen by frequently collecting anonymous workplace feedback directly from seafarers on safety critical issues. Bring it on, ScoutBase. Hi, Singapore. I'm Matt. I'm from ScoutBase. ScoutBase is a Danish maritime startup working real hard to provide real-time visibility of crew life and work conditions on board to the maritime industry. In the maritime industry, there is a data gap. You see, when it comes to running our business and taking care of our physical assets, uh, we're really good at being uh, proactive and monitoring so that we can help out any issues that might arise before we have uh, more serious problems. Today, the problem is that we don't have that same mechanism uh, for seafarers, for the crew on board. Luckily, that is what we're here to change with ScoutBase. So what we build with ScoutBase is a tech solution that allows us to collect data continuously directly from the crew on board uh, the ships every day. The solution is 100% anonymous, which is important because that allows us to gather honest uh, feedback. We've we've done it in a way that is super super easy for seafarers to engage with, and uh, the result of that is a very very high engagement rate. And as a consequence, we collect a lot of data points every month, all having to do with how people are doing on board. So this data, we we serve. Uh, we serve back into the maritime organizations via our real-time dashboard. This allows people working in the organizations to get a, a finger on the pulse, you can say, and, and get full transparency when it comes to the, to the conditions uh, around crew well-being and, and the conditions for, for, for their work performance. It also allows them to compare the different vessels that they have in their fleet so that they can see where we might want to um, intervene or, or, or have something to learn and transfer to, to the other ships. And the, the whole idea is that we are able to now spot trends and needs for early intervention and do something about it before it's too late. The kind of data that we are collecting uh, uh, with ScoutBase is you can say almost like a 360 degree view on work and life on board a ship. These are all factors that, that traditionally emerge when we, when we have accidents, when we have people breaking down, when we have people leaving. But with ScoutBase, we can actually see the early trends of these uh, indicators and do something about them before it's too late. So together, let's build a healthy climate for safety, performance and well-being for seafarers to thrive. Thank you. All right. Thank you, ScoutBase. Uh, next up, we have Sine. Sine provides powerful information to offshore construction and maritime supply chain companies to combine operational efficiency and sustainability using both an AI cloud platform and, an, and a data collection network at sea. Take it away, Sine. Hello, my name is Yanis. I'm the founder of Sine. At Sine, we believe in a world where humanity and biodiversity can live together on the ocean planet. For that, we deliver powerful information to maritime stakeholders to help them conciliate sustainability with operational efficiency. We address uh, three markets, renewable energies, wildlife resources, and supply chain. And those markets face two common challenges, operational inefficiency and environmental regulation. And data could play a major role for that. The good news is that there is a lot of data. The bad news is that most of the time, those maritime corporates do not have the appropriate tools or expertise to process it into valuable information. At SINAI, we have created a unique digital hub, allowing all stakeholders to access 350 terabytes of qualified data worldwide, such as vessel position, meteocean, wildlife, earth observation, or fixed asset position. They can plug any type of IoT sensors. We support more than 20 IoT sensors type. 
and then we process all those data together to provide new prediction and new information such as estimated time of arrival to ship to a port, port congestion, fleet visibility, meteo ocean analytics or CO2 emission. And we also provide an API and model for sustainability, so air quality, water quality, underwater noise and the impact on the environment. So using our product, uh, users access prediction which is more precise than existing information and they can combine efficiency with uh, sustainability by avoiding 250 pollution even in a year, saving 1.5 kiloton of CO2 as well as saving 400 k euros uh, in data analysis per year. The market is growing very fast and expected to be 8 billion dollars in 2027. There is a lot of actors in the value chain but it's very fragmented and Cine is a unique solution uh, where all, all uh, actors can interoperate with the hub and all the logo that you can see here is assigned customers or assigned partners uh, with Sinai Hub. Uh, our team is doubly skilled uh, in maritime and AI. Uh, we did a lot of data at seas and developed uh, uh, a lot of algorithms and thanks to these teams, we have achieved 50% uh, uh, growth uh, year, to year to year since uh, 2019 uh, to reach 5 million euros turnovers uh, this year and uh, we are profitable. So if you are a corporate and you want to test our API catalog uh, for a free demo, please contact me and if you are investors and you want to participate to the uh, uh, ongoing uh, round, uh, we have a data room and you can connect me with, with me. Thank you very much. I'm Yanis and this is Sinai. Thank you, Sinai. Uh, next up, we have Frigata Space. Using unique machine learning algorithms, Frigata Space develops an Earth observation platform to determine the level of pollutants in water bodies. So bring it on, Frigata Space. My name is Maria Fernanda Gonzalez. I love physics, mathematics, satellite technology, and I love the planet. 15 years ago, after I finished my PhD in quantum physics, I began to create technology for big companies. I was working for them in order to understand data to generate more business. This was a funny business and funny job, but I was worried about the planet. For that reason, I founded Fregate Space two years ago. 90% of people in the world need a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. We actually need real-time pollution detection technology to cover the entire planet. And in this moment, we have the key technological capabilities to deal with planet pollution's problem. Fregate Space is an air observation platform to discover and monitor air and water pollution around the world in real time. Fregate Space has four modules. The first one is data. With data, we capture information from different satellite constellations, Earth observations constellations, in this moment, there are more than 27 around the world. We can include drones images, multispectral images too. Uh, that information goes to our brain. In the brain, we have their, our own algorithms, machine learning and big data algorithms. With the platform, we can calculate anywhere in the world in 20 seconds. And the console is prepared for the clients in order to see the strategical KPIs. In this example, we have different uh, algorithms for um, different places in the world and for different type of water contamination and air. We can capture plastics. Uh, we can uh, understand uh, oil spills. We can understand uh, organic matter, organic carbon dissolved in water, red tide. We work for ports and we can understand air uh, and particles in the air. This is our business model. It's SaaS B2B. It depends on the number of um, modules that the client uses and the shape of the region uh, the client is monitoring. We have a very clear go-to-market strategy. We want to grow next year, begin to grow. Our uniqueness is that we have a proprietary technology. We have skills to scale. We, are, we need more executive skills to scale, but we have all the elements in this moment to be the biggest platform for sustainability in the world. And other important thing is that we are uh, closing big agreements con with uh, uh, big companies like Cisco and Cesiro in Australia. Our um, agreement with Cisco is in Spain initially, and our uh, agreement with Cesiro is initially in, in Chile in order to expand the technologies in Latin America. 
This is our team. We are uh, prepared to um, scale the company and we have the correct skills to do that. We have a strong technological and scientific uh, uh, skills. Fregate Space has been awarded nine times in 20 months. And in this year, we have a, a projection of revenue to begin to grow. Our algorithms are very robust and we can um, use this for different kinds of clients. We make visible the invisible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fregata Space. And for our last startup, we have Green Router. Green Router develops and sells innovative software products and services designed to calculate and facilitate the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions along the supply chain. Take it away, Green Router. Hi everyone, I'm Michele Ferraro from Green Router. In Green Router, we support our customer in reaching their decarbonization target, starting from CO2 emission calculation. Green Router was established in 2016 in Milan as an innovative startup by three founders. Today, it counts 16 people and more than 30 customers. In 2021, we calculated more than 1 million tons of CO2 emissions related to transport, company sites, and logistic sites. The core service we provide is our software, Rerouter, a CO2 emission calculation tool that is certified as compliant with the GLAD framework, a global protocol from Smart Freight Center of Amsterdam that's also at the basis of the upcoming ISO 14083 and it's compliant also to the EM 16-2058. By means of Green Router, you can compute and monitor your CO2 emissions, report results in line with global standards, and produce what-if analysis with scenario analysis to evaluate the impact of CO2 emission reduction and build feasible carbon budget in line with carbon targets. As you can see by these slides, among our clients, we have several large-scale shippers from fashion, luxury, food, fast-moving customer goods, retail, and so on. Among our client base, also both national and international logistics operators. To conclude, we know that uh, supply chains are complex to map, but a good mapping provides accurate results. Supply chains are complex to map due to uh, data quality and availability issues, data sources, and low visibility of real flows. But starting from accurate results, you can build solid scenario analysis. And what is make you aware of the impact. So a uh, green action mix become a carbon budget. Router, plan your journey with us. All right, thank you, Green Router. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us at the Sustainably Expo. I know it's been a packed day. I uh, hope everyone still has plenty of energy left, although I think I see some of you kind of uh, losing that. Uh, if you'd like to connect with uh, our startups after the event, please indicate your interest by scanning the QR code on screen. If you'd like to find out more or have any questions about our program, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or the rest of the team. And with that, I'll pass the mic back to Wayne to bring on the next segment.